so I, I'd like to use this talk to think about and problematize how pride and shame are understood and how they've resonated through the city of Hull in the recent past. In particular, I want to talk about civic pride and civic shame and how manifestations of self-esteem, boosterism, status and stigmatization work their way through local concerns, cultural behaviors and political cultures. It's also a way of trying to better understand Hull, which is where I come from and where I grew up. I want to start by thanking quite a lot of people, first of all, uh, and I hope that in all of these thanks, you'll get a sense of how interdisciplinary this research is and the different literatures that, that I'll be drawing on. Um, it also saves me time doing a massive literature review as well at the beginning. So a um, uh, huge thanks, first of all, to my PhD supervisors, um, Frank Hubby and Keeney, who's a leading expert in cultural policy, David Atkinson, cultural and historical geographer, and Rudy Wurzel, who is a comparative European political scientist. Huge thank you to them for their support and guidance over the last four years. And the thesis also draws heavily on methodologies and theories from theatre and performance. My background before research being as a director and before that as an actor. And uh, very importantly, thank you to my research participants, some of whom I know are uh, here this evening um, uh, or might be watching the recording a little bit later. And there I am on some uh, research uh, outings. And the, the, I want to draw particular attention to the person in the middle with the sunglasses on. That's uh, Dr. Jill Hughes, who's doing remarkable work in the city. And she leads on a project called The Hull We Want. And I'm wearing their t-shirt tonight. I hope, I hope you can see that. Um, uh, so I also want to thank um, Middle Child Theatre Company, um, who and the playwright Maureen Lennon, they allowed me to follow them uh, for a year as they were making the play Us Against Whatever, which looks at the Brexit vote in Hull and how it came to be and what it might mean. And it became a real key methodological tool for my research. Um, they're a brilliant company and they're doing a lot of good for the cultural sector in the city. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that play in massive detail, but if it's something that people want to talk about at the end, um, I'd be really interested in talking about how you can use theatre methodologies in uh, political science uh, research, this kind of work. And I'm also going to draw on, as Catherine said, my most recent work um, at Southampton. Uh, the project was the AHRC funded Towns and the Cultural Economies of Recovery. And we were looking at how some English towns understand their cultural and heritage capacities particularly in the context of levelling up and initiatives such as the Stronger Towns Fund. So huge, huge thank you to Professors Nikki Marsh, Will May and Catherine. Um, so I think it's important that we come to better understandings of civic pride and shame, particularly in the current political context where civic pride has become a key output and object of policy evaluation particularly as Boris Johnson's post-Brexit government announced multiple levelling up policies. And you can see there in the top left, section 1.3 of the levelling up prospectus states that prosperity can be measured in many ways. However, for many people, the most powerful barometer of economic success is the positive change they see and the pride they feel in the places they call home. Indeed, Improved perception of place is literally at the center of the Stronger Towns Fund evaluation framework that assumes that civic pride will contribute to sustainable and thriving places. Before moving on, I've got uh, three small disclaimers that I just want to make. And the first is that in focusing primarily on pride and shame, I accept that there's a danger of obscuring or downplaying all of the other feelings and experiences in whole and how they also might work to inform political and cultural behaviours. Certainly what I'm going to talk about is infused by and accentuated 
by many different feelings and affects. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to investigate them all in my PhD, and there isn't time to talk about them all here. But again, we might want to discuss some of that at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. However, um, I am guided by Thomas Sheff's claim that pride and shame may be the most powerful forces in the human world. Forces that I think when coupled with place and the places inherent issues of boundary, governance and identity can be significantly amplified and politicized. Pride and joy is particularly, they particularly accompany one another within local government visioning and strategy materials. So a shout out here to Joe Sophia, who's talking a couple of weeks for this series, is going to look at joy and heritage after the lockdowns. My second disclaimer is that although it's going to become clear that I'm quite critical of how pride is being mobilized by some people in power, my intention isn't to denigrate the political and social efficacy of the emotion. Reclaiming pride has been enormously powerful in addressing stigmatizations of many kinds, such as homophobia, racism, and mental health, affecting legal and social change and providing a positive sense of identity and community for many. And my final disclaimer, this is a snapshot. My, my PhD was a snapshot of a place in a, uh, in a particular moment in time. And what I'm going to talk about is a snapshot of a snapshot. So my field work was pretty much 2017 to 29, uh, 2019. It was therefore pre-pandemic, pre-leveling up. Um, and I, I want you to maybe try and remember that it's particularly volatile emotions through the post-Brexit period, post-EU referendum period. So we had things like the Oliver Letwin Amendment, the proroguing of Parliament, extension of Brexit deadlines, Theresa May's emotional resignation, and of course, the murder of Joe Cox MP, which was all in the name of nationalism and national feelings. So I, I, I think I, I just want to draw your attention to that, that particular moment when emotions were running very high concerning the um, political culture of, of the country and local places. Uh, and just to draw attention to two other projects that are happening right now that are about the city, if you wanted to find out more about Hull, um, uh, which are the Ships in the Sky project, which is based around the Alan Boyson uh, mural in an iconic city centre building on an iconic city centre building, and the Half-Life of the Blitz on Hull, which looks at the political, social, cultural legacies of that particular time in the city. Um, so I was in Hull a couple of weeks ago for my Viva, and I went to the Ferens Art Gallery where they currently have this exhibition called Pride in Our City. And I was really struck by how much the theme of pride and coming out especially are still so central to the city's self narration. And I want to draw your attention to the writing on the bottom right, if you can see that, which says, uh, 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 I'm guessing an LGBT participant of this exhibition said that LGBT pride has become interwoven within the city's fabric. It represents its people, the people who live here or work here, and the people who visit. I think it just makes the city a more vibrant place to be. That's why it's important. I'm going to come back to some of those words a little bit later. Um, particularly vibrant. I can see Catherine nodding along there. <laughs> um, and of course, it's in queer theory that much theoretical heavy lifting on pride and shame has occurred. Eve Sedgwick claims that shame and pride are different interlinings of the same glove, and Sally Munt that pride is dependent on shame. However, shame is often repressed because acknowledgement of it is to bring it into being. While shame itself is rarely mentioned by name, my data contains moving accounts of other cities being able to offer more than Hull, which is a place where voting never makes a difference, shaped by abandoned, derelict buildings that stand as visual reminders of the deeper wounds from being a forgotten 
or left behind place. And it's perhaps those left behind feelings that led Hull to vote overwhelmingly to leave the European Union. A decision that was interpreted by many as being inward looking and protectionist. However, the following year, Hull hosted the UK city of culture. And for some people, a Brexit city hosting UK city of culture was something of a paradox where culture in this context is understood as being outward looking and cosmopolitan. Hull's winning bid centered around the transformational theme a city coming out of the shadows. Again, that sense of being made visible and importantly being made visible to a critical gaze, previously shaming or stigmatizing gaze. So Brexit and UK city of culture in whole was something of a strange conjuncture with lots of complicated agendas relating to the wider political and cultural context. So this strange conjuncture became the central problem of my thesis. Luckily for me, Martin Green, who directed Hull 2017 programme, and incidentally is the director of the Unboxed Festival, which I'm going to refer to at the very end of this talk, that Martin said that the city has refused the Brexit narrative and that Brexit doesn't stop cities being outward looking. Uh, thanks to City of Culture for Martin Green, Hull had become a forward thinking, outward facing bastion of cosmopolitanism. Not everybody in the city agreed with him. And um, I spoke to a local artist and activist, Richard Lees, who felt that there was uh, absence of critique through Hull 2017 and particularly what he felt was an exclusion of Hull's ethnic minority communities. And Richard renamed the endeavor Hull UK City of Brexit Culture. And we can see here on the right, one of Richard's, uh, I think it's a woodcut, I hope I've got that right. Um, and the H sign there, spinning, mesmerizing, everybody, the spectacle of, of Hull 2017. Um, and I think Richard would say that the hand there is representative of the particularly uh, freelance grassroots cultural sector who are not waving in the spectacle of city of culture but drowning and that's also a reference to the stevie smith poem stevie smith being a famous daughter of hull um so um clearly hull's ongoing attempts to grasp and reimagine itself makes it a distinctive site for understanding how civic feelings operate in the modern world. So, a little bit of background on Hull. Um, a major port city, there it is in the northeast of England. Hull's played crucial roles in the history of Britain and Northern Europe. In 1642, rebellious action by the city's governor, John Hotham, prompted the English Civil War, apparently, providing inspiration for the whole 2017 play, The Hypocrite. And in 1833, the city was pivotal to the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, the famous son of Hull being William Wilberforce. Uh, it was the place in the 1930s where anti-fascists battled Oswald Mosley's black shirts and also the home of Amy Johnson, who defied gender expectations to fly solo to Australia. So there's grown from all of these stories, a mythology within the city of Hull as rebellious and non-conformist. As one participant described, Hull is its own republic. The uh, feeling of which I think was, is embodied within this Banksy mural that appeared in the city uh, just a few weeks after 2017, uh, near the beginning of January, 2018. Like many cities, Hull's present day civic identity is indelibly marked by the Victorian era, which saw the emergence of keen civic uh, rivalries. Asa Briggs describes the rivalry between Leeds and Bradford during the late Victorian era, with differences between the cities a cause for pride. By contrast, Hull had long been noted as idiosyncratic and somehow apart. In 1926, Robert Rudmose Brown described the development of Hull 
noting that due to its isolation from other great cities, no other city in England has developed a higher degree of co civic consciousness and pride of place. Yet, Hall suffered significantly from bomb damage in the Second World War, and it's perhaps during this period that Hall's sense of self as forgotten or overlooked might be located. Indeed, many of my research participants throughout the generations recall as a snob that the city was omitted from national narratives during the Second World War, in particular, um, its unnaming by the BBC, which instead referred to it as a North East Coast town. So uh, rather in describe the BBC in describing the bombing in Hull, instead of naming it as Hull, they just called it a, a North East Coast town, which, which many people took, took offense to. The fishing industry has also contributed hugely to the shaping of the city's fortunes with its personalities and narratives deeply embedded in Hull's post-war cultural and social imaginary. In 1975, and in the context of the North Atlantic Cod Wars, long-time Hull East MP John Prescott campaigned no in the European Economic Community's membership referendum. That's essentially the same as equivalent of voting leave, I guess. Um, for, for his fears that continued membership uh, would kill Hull's fishing community. Uh, many older people in Hull view the resulting common fisheries policy as the cause for the industry's decline, which meant that the, the 2016 referendum for some was an opportunity to reverse those actions taken over 40 years before. And I spoke to Pauline, an 86 year old leave voter um, in the city who said, look at what they did to fishing in Hull. I didn't want to be in, in the first place. Um, and we can see there the way that Pauline is othering the EU, they being the distant and ever powerful force that should be resisted. And through the 1980s and Thatcherism, it represented a particularly aggressive program of neoliberal restructuring that had immediate and devastating effects from which Hull has struggled to emerge. Numerous league tables and poverty reports appear to offer quantitative proof of this crapness, with Hull often at or near the bottom of socioeconomic indicators or near the top of those measuring negative impact. And for those of you that don't know, although I'm sure for those of you from Hull, the, the, the crap terms book will be very familiar. Um, Hull, I think it was 2005, was supposedly the crappiest town of all the crap towns in the UK. Um, yet this stigmatization can also bring about its own sense of pride and Hull's negative image is paradoxically and often humorously been assumed into the identity of many Hollensians as a badge of dishonour, an entrenched parochialism perhaps, which Gillian, a retired school teacher, described to me as, there is a sense that the city is really special. Spiritually, it is about us. Nobody cares about us. We're put down as a crap town. People make bad jokes about us in the media. And I think there is that kind of spirit in the city that can be incredibly brave. We are a bit different, we are whole, but there is also a kind of weakness in there that saps confidence. The stigmatizing rhetoric of waste or excrement continues still in the city today and is in various ways normalized, contested and lampooned within the different cultures of the city. And the effectual consequences of this permeate through left kind debates perhaps informing um, the Hull's clamours for change through the referendum and post UK City of Culture. Um, so through my field work um, and the different methodologies that, that I used, there was a lot of feeling about what the future might hold for Hull. And, um, but because particularly Hull 2017 and the Leave campaign made great promises about how they both might transform the city. So it's not surprising, I suppose, that civic pride and civic shame emerged as, as really key themes throughout my, my fieldwork. 
And sometimes that might be in really obvious ways. So people would say, Hall 2017 made me feel proud, or the state of that building is shameful. But it also came through in, in non-representational ways. So uh, people with strong full accents might look away when they were talking about how their accent is received by people sometimes in certain circumstances, or the opposite, when people revealed that they were a whole 2017 volunteer, these great big beaming smiles all, all over their, their faces. And I, I just want to draw your attention to, to a few images here. So um, we have, again, uh, so middle left, um, the hull being on the weather map was a massively important thing for many of my respondents. Again, the sense of hull being made visible to a country that they felt had perhaps shamed it in the past. Um, the top left, uh, this is a, a respondent who uh, wrote a poem in the end, and these are some of the notes that, that went into making the poem. Um, Mobilisation of a pink and blue army. It's not shit anymore. Pride in a forgotten city and fiercely defending the town. The reference to pink and blue army there being about the whole 2017 volunteers who would often be referred to as an army in the press, sometimes as um, the army for the council or Martin's army. And there's something complicated about that, that, that idea of them as an army that potentially is there not only to spread enthusiasm, which they undoubtedly did and tried, but also perhaps to dispel critique and be the voice, be an official voice for um, the city and for Hull 2017. So Hull's journey from crap town to proud city has become something of a trope for journalists and policymakers and held as a model for cities bidding the UK City of Culture 2025. And uh, there was a conference at the University of Hull in 2018 that was looking at some of the early findings um, from the monitoring and evaluation. And one very, very senior national cultural funder, I'm not going to name them here, but we can talk about it afterwards if people want to. Um, they said that the increased pride statistic is the one to be most excited about. Uh, and that's really curious because what they're referring to is actually a really fragile statistic that shows only a relatively modest boost in civic pride at the beginning of 2017. It clearly dwindled towards the end of the year and reverted back almost to pre-UK City of Culture levels in, at the beginning of 2018. So why should policymakers be so excited by pride? And what are the impacts of such policies on the communities whose civic pride is so eagerly sought? I think it's really difficult to entangle this from the increasingly desperate need of cultural organisations to justify funding. In other words, civic pride is perhaps being instrumentalised to evidence the value of culture. In a way, this makes sense when pride, as I've already shown, is so highly valued by the current government. Therefore, dominating the whole 2017 discourse was the transformative power of culture from shame to pride, essentially. And a common trope here being that through culture-led urban regeneration, all can look forward to a prosperous future free from the crap town or shithole narratives that have dogged the city for decades. That said, expressions of shame or embarrassment are coming from or living in Hull were in every single research interview and often in the language of waste or crapness. So uh, this is uh, Sharon. Uh, Sharon's a community arts worker from Hull and she said the following. We had two Irish lads with us from Belfast a couple of years ago painting murals. They said one thing you would never find in Belfast was a Belfast person slagging Belfast off even no matter how dark and bad it got in Belfast, Belfast people would stand up for Belfast. Well, I don't think you get that in Hull. People say, I'm from Hull and Hull shit. They say you would never get a Belfast person saying, I'm from Belfast and I think Belfast shit. 
they said that was the first thing they noticed about the city, that we were all very, very eager to say how shit our city is. I think that's a culture thing that's developed in Hull because we're so off the beaten track, aren't we? You have to go to get to Hull. Here, Sharon's excretory language articulates the negative feelings of territorial stigmatization associated with Hull as peripheral. And it might on the surface appear to demonstrate the hallmarks of a collective internalized shame, but attending to the non-representational aspects of this and other encounters, I think something more positive is also occurring. And difficult to capture in transcription is the sense of humor and the amount of laughter that happened through these encounters. Sharon's final statement about Hall being off the beaten track, she made this lurching physical movement that virtually threw her off a chair and the sound of screeching tires as if turning a particularly sharp corner at high speed. Which anybody that knows getting to Hull, particularly from the south, is kind of what you've got to do, especially on the train, sort of straight up to Doncaster and then that way. Um, it was a really performative and comic gesture that made us both laugh. And I understood this as a shared recognition of the extremity of Hull's peripheral mental and physical geographies and the kind of the extra effort that you need to reach the city from outside. In a way, she was kind of saying, you'd have to be mad to come here, reflecting feelings of Hull as the end of the line and not the beginning of the line. And such behavior, I think, exemplifies resilience against stigmatization, where, um, to quote Mark Featherstone, a sociologist, negative civic pride takes the practical form of a sense of unity in social exclusion and marginality. Rather than the city's inhabitants thinking Hull is so shit, they've given up defending it, as the Irish lads understood it. Hull's supposed shitness becomes a mode of bonding, providing connections which others may not understand. It might be shit, but it's our shit. And as a marker of true residents of the city who can say, we're shit and we know we are, but only to each other. Very important, only to each other. Um, a similar thing occurred when I spoke with Rob. Um, Rob uh, is a former taxi driver in his early mid sixties. And he said, it's amazing the number of people that do have a downer on it. I'm out of touch because I haven't been on the road for two years, but the number of people you pick up and go, it's a fucking shit town this. I must admit, sometimes I went along with it because I picked up Tuesday, Wednesday night, group of lads, and they said, where's the best place to go for a Tuesday night? And I said, Leeds. So in telling this story, he assumed the manner of uh, Les Dawson or Peter Kay type stand-up comedian. Uh, and I suspect it wasn't quite a true story and one that he practiced over time and retelling uh, to hone the delivery of the punchline, all of which stressing, albeit in a humorous way, that leads is superior to Hull, at least for a good night out in the middle of the week. And this self-deprecating humour functions as a unifying force, laughing it off, especially collectively, is a tactic that the city's learnt to endure its humiliations, form in-group bonds and solace, away from the shaming league tables and crap town joke books. There's a kind of joy in uh, resisting those narratives that becomes a form of parochial resistance to the wider social, economic, political and cultural environment. Um, however, uh, sorry, importantly, it's done in a fatalistic way that replicates and reinforces the myth that Hull is shit. So what do we do with this? I hope it's clear by now that what I'm arguing for is a more critical and a more nuanced understanding of civic pride that takes into account its everyday manifestations and all of its many complicated facets and I've only talked about one or two in Hull and there are many in Hull in, uh, uh, and in many other places. Obviously underpinning all of this is the discomforting fact that civic pride 
a very singular understanding of civic pride, I think, is being more frequently and more explicitly written in to local and national policies. And um, Tom Collins has written about this very persuasively in a number of publications. Uh, and in a way, I think what we're seeing now is that this is enlisting some cultural producers, however well-meaning they might be. My thesis argues that Hall's recent history has been marked by such modes of emotional governance that have through top-down approaches, such as those of Hall 2017, influenced and at times exploited local political cultures and feelings. Without effective devolution of powers and fairer redistributive policies, how does pride washing left behind places make them more prosperous? Worryingly, perhaps, the language that's used to get to grips with this is a little bit limited, with the language of corporate boosterism increasingly normalized. And in one focus group, after the participants used lots of crappy language, I asked them what it would take for Hull to not be a crap town. And they replied with phrases such as buzzing, buzzy, and lively. They described busy Wednesday afternoon in Sheffield, exciting nights out in Leeds, of course, and the excellent shopping in York. And you can see a couple of responses there. Um, for Ruth and Rosie, and for Rob, uh, that we met earlier, um, a not crap city is and feels like somewhere else. And in their descriptions of these other places and experiences, they're pointing to what, for them at least, Hull currently lacks. Indeed, by using words such as buzzing, buzzy and lively, one might argue that they're pointing towards the kind of created city advocated by Richard Florida, and perhaps an indication of how much the top-down language of his brand of the creative city rhetoric has penetrated. And this isn't unique to Hull. Um, during our town's recent town's research, um, we ask senior decision makers in towns across the country to imagine that all the improvement works for their towns have been completed on time and in budget, and then ask them three words that would describe that town. And we were really struck that the word cloud is there that gives you an idea of the responses um, and the strength of some of those responses or the, the frequency of some of those responses. Um, we, we were really struck by the fact that they could have said anything, but they all chose emotional words, mostly, and that vibrant is clearly to the fore. Given that words like vibrant, thriving and proud appear so frequently in local government st strategy policies. And given that it's such a key part of the Creative City Consultants Toolkit, but what does it actually mean now? And has it perhaps lost any relevance or meaning beyond place marketing speak, which is so often driven by commercial imperatives? It's suspiciously close to a new pandemic buzzword which is place animation. Um, I need to do more thinking about this and I'd be really interested to hear what other people might say, but we're hearing a lot of people using language like place animation and within councils that that's their job, they're the place animator. Uh, and again, it's so often wielded by business interests that instrumentalize culture for economic ends and it's only measured in high street footfall and economic spend. So how does vibrancy translate to a town's political culture? An often overlooked dynamic of the Brexit vote in Hull is that at just under 63%, Hull's turnout was one of the lowest in the country. It is perhaps what some observers have argued is the outcome of several decades of anti-politics. And we can see there that Actually, more people in Hull didn't vote in the EU referendum than voted Remain, and almost the same number voted to leave. Hull has three Westminster parliamentary constituencies, Hull East, Hull West and Hull North. And at the last general election, those three constituencies were the three lowest turnout at the general election. In Hull East, which is actually John Prescott's former constituency, more people 
didn't vote at the last general election than did. Turnout was roughly 49%. And in many wards, uh, council wards in the city at the last local election, turnout was less than 20%. And in some, it's hovering around the 10% mark. And um, you can see there, I need to move you because I can't see the quote. I'm just going to move you up. There we go. Um, uh, I spoke to a young man, he, he was in his mid-twenties, and um, otherwise very engaged, very engaged with the city of culture in particular, which is why he wanted to get involved with this research. Um, and I met him for a drink, and he said, um, when we were talking about Brexit, it's, it's been years of shit. Financial crisis, continuing political crises. You kind of get to a point where you go, I can't, it can't get much worse. Well, it's got more chaotic. I just don't have, I mean, even, I just don't have, I've become apathetic to everything completely. And I think if there was another referendum, it would pain me to have to vote because I just think it's been shit. So I'm not saying here that this particular respondent was responding to the local political situation clearly I think he was responding where he was. He was responding to the national political situation, but it reveals itself in whole, I think, in this particularly anti-political sentiment, I think is quite worrying. Um, Anti-politics names a collection of different political sentiments, such as hostility or negativity to politics. And this ideological void creates the conditions for emotion become the driving force of politics, a shift that means that political competence becomes tied to the ability to manage emotions and that the expression of emotion becomes a source of political capital. You'll have seen these images many times, I'm sure. There's more to say here about the role of local media in these processes and Hall's local paper has a lot to answer for. With good reason, it's earned itself the nickname Hull daily hile, promoting far-right nationalistic narratives for clickbait attention. I particularly think that more research is needed to understand the relationship between local media and contemporary UK political culture. So like you might say, perhaps celebratory pride boosting initiatives such as Hull 2017 aren't a bad thing after all. Well, my research has shown how mass participation in such a top-down cultural programme didn't mean increased engagement in political processes. In fact, it went down. So I'm nearly there, the final two slides. I just want to suggest where this research might develop. Given that Coventry as UK City of Culture 2021 is promoting itself as a proud city of radicalism, activism and reinvention, it will be interesting to see if it has any influence on the wider public sphere. In many ways, Coventry's political culture is not unlike Hull's. It too voted to leave the European Union and it's struggling with low and decreasing voter turnout. It will be interesting to see how Coventry 2021 attends to such low political engagement and provides a test case perhaps for the role culture might play in enabling democratic participation. And finally, as the controversial Festival UK 2022 draws nearer, now renamed Unboxed, and previously known as the Brexit Festival, it will be important to trace its engagement with issues such as nationalism, migration, and place shaming, and to analyze how and with what effects its claims to bring unity, joy, and hope are attempted. A key question will be to ask how societies can and should deal with the negative emotions and feelings that motivate support for the new radical right. Unboxed organisers were always going to find themselves in a tricky situation with this, I think, funded as it is to promote post-Brexit Britain to international investors. Unfortunately, researching this might require the kind of critical approach to evaluation and monitoring that's unfeasible for many universities under current modes of delivery, at least for partner institutions where the reputational and economic imperatives 
of singing from the same hymn sheet and working towards the same outcomes mean that critical voices are increasingly unwelcome. Critical methodologies that acknowledge the realities of power are vital, especially in cultural mega event reset right now, where powerful stakeholders impose questions that reflect their own interests. I'd love to see an independently produced unboxed fringe festival, for instance, and migrants in culture are doing a lot of work asking important questions about this initiative. Um, such a fringe festival and a critical inquiry might provoke more critical culture and cultural engagement and would make an important contribution to improving the health of the public sphere, perhaps bringing some trust back to political processes and collective decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, for a really wonderful uh, presentation. Um, we want to show your appreciation using reaction button or in the, in the traditional manner on screen as well. A really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so rich, um, so many wonderful um, sources, uh, such a, a brilliant kind of synthesis of those different elements um, kind of coming together in, in the political and cultural um, situation in, in Hull over the last few years and a characteristically really generous and inclusive presentation as well from acknowledging your contributors and collaborators to uh, flagging up some of those exciting current project projects um, in Hull um, uh, as well. I, I especially enjoyed your really nuanced consideration of pride and shame at uh, the way you drew attention. So I, as you know, Michael, we, we've spoken uh, previously about that kind of very narrow language of the vibrant on the positive side, but seeing you illustrate just how um, how narrow and how um, focused in that kind of semantic field of you know, excrement, crapness, shit, waste, um, that kind of negative language is in the whole was really, um, really revealing, really interesting. And of course, so many questions that you've opened up there about pride and its very central place in, in, in policy today, how we might begin to, to measure or represent or interrogate that um, in, in new ways. Um, I want to also thank my colleague Adam, who's been busy doing some Virtuoso live tweeting over on Twitter. So do check in with that um, if you're interested and feel free to share your responses. And it's also great to see um, responses already in the chat. And it's really interesting, I think, to see the strength of feeling and the emotion in some of those responses um, there already. Um, so um, we do have some time now for questions and discussion. Um, I noticed we have, um, at least one, I think a few more questions emerging in the chat. So do feel free to add your question into the chat box um, if you would like, um, and I can either pick that up or invite you to ask it if you would like to, or you can raise your hand using the Zoom function, which is at the bottom um, of your screen. So I think we'll, we'll jump straight into the questions that we have here. And there's a question from uh, uh, Irene Galu, I apologise if I've not pronounced that correctly. Irene, Irene, do you want me to ask your question or would you like to ask on camera? I don't hear from you. I will jump in and, and present that. OK, so there's Irene, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, of course, I can ask it directly. Um, I was really interested in the aspects of like how we can measure pride elements or what we actually talk about when we talk about pride in a sense. So I, in my own research and um, through my role in Historic England actually, I always came across like this question in terms of evaluation indicators and how we can actually talk about those things. So I was wondering if uh, in the bottom up, um, approach that your research took, did your informants use any elements of like, for example, uh, attachment to place or belonging to place as part of um, their description of the concept? Thank you. Um, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so difficult to reduce emotion to um, quantitative metric, first of all. Um, and I think that uh, the problem, I'm sure, I'd be really interested to talk to you longer after this, actually. I'm sure that, um, you know, you do see sometimes in these civic pride metrics or emotional metrics, people using faces to describe how 
uh, people feel. And actually, I should I, I did have a slide where I was going to point to the Young Foundation Civic Strength Index, which I think perhaps presents a useful way of um, turning civic pride into sort of action that can be measurable. So if people are interested in that, that might be something to look at. It's the Young Foundation. It was a, a civic strength for London, I think is the report. Um, uh, but yeah, in, in my own research, I think there's a problem in the way that civic pride was measured through city of culture, that it was purely quantitative. Um, it doesn't explain how people understood civic pride and it doesn't allow for any of that nuance. There's always an attempt in these kinds of evaluation projects to give city of official evaluation projects to give uh, kind of qualitative uh, examples throughout the, these very thick, often very thick documents that people end up just putting on a shelf. But it's those headline stats that end up uh, getting into the newspapers and being uh, uh, spread. But certainly talking to people about how they connected uh, to place through talking about civic pride. I mean, the interviews would plan to be 40, 45 minutes. But the moment you start talking about We Are Whole, for instance, which was one of the biggest pride inducing projects right at the beginning of 2017, we'd be there for hours because people would talk about family histories, um, all of the different events that, that we are whole, for those of you that don't know, was a kind of potted history, a real spectacular um, sound and light projection that happened at the beginning of the year that told the different histories of the city. Um, and it was a, effectively that particular project that, that had that emotional switch for the city, I think, in the first week. I don't know if that answers the question. Please tell me if it hasn't. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. It was very informative. I'm sure the interviews always bring so many aspects and uh, I totally understand this part. But yeah, it was interesting to hear because you showed some quotes. So yeah, I wanted to unpick that. Thank you. Yeah, I sorry, I, I, I am going to name check somebody else, actually. I don't know that he's here, but um, there's a brilliant PhD student at the University of Coventry. He's called Charlie Ingram. And Charlie is doing his PhD is about alternative methodologies for civic pride um, dissemination, how we communicate civic pride. And he's doing some really interesting work using verbatim theatres. Somebody's just put that in. Uh, I can see that. Um, so, you, yeah, hopefully Charlie will be publishing soon. Brilliant, thank you. Great question, Iranian, and wonderful um, uh, answer, Michael. There's lots of questions and, and really rich comments coming in the chat, and we'll come back to some of those. I can also see that Catherine Baker, you have your hand raised. So um, over to you. Thanks. Hello, I won't turn my camera on because you've all got better bookshelves than I've got behind me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much, Michael, first of all, for giving us a chance to hear this much about your work. Um, and I've got a couple of kind of linked questions and my background for asking them, for those who don't know, is on one hand, I've worked in health since 2012. On the other hand, some of my research goes into mega events and the politics of pride with a capital P in Central and Eastern Europe. So I was really energised when, when the presentation kicked off by thinking about pride in a queer sense. What I want to do, I think, is kind of push that a little bit further with a couple of questions. Um, First of all, with your participants who were part of the LGBTQ community in some way, how did it seem that they were experiencing pride versus shame and particularly the relationship between pride versus shame in their own sexual slash gender identities and pride versus shame in their local identity and the, the national context that it's now in? So I think that's my first question. And my second one is shorter than that. Um, and it's, could you say a bit more about what you think foregrounding, you know, LGBTQ pride, LGBTQ heritage, LGBTQ presence in the fabric of Hull has done for the city in all of this? Oh, um, I'm really, really pleased that you're here, Catherine. Um, 
I was going to start the talk with a, a much longer exploration of that pride uh, exhibition. And in particular, there's a, there was a little pin badge there um, that was based on the dead bod character um image those of you that are not from Hull won't quite understand what that means um but it represents kind of a working class history for the city and it's a little bird that's on its sort of back facing up like a dead bod and there's a little pin badge there um in this exhibition that's called gay bod and uh, it, that what that really made me think more about queer histories and queer cities and understanding Hull's resistance to stigmatization through, through a queer lens, which has always been in my thesis, I think, but not quite as present as I would think it should be. And I, I would really like to discuss that with you in more detail at some point, Catherine, because I think, I think I've got a lot to learn from, from you about that. There was a point in my research where I nearly did focus on queer understandings of whole 2017 and political culture. Um, uh, I can't re really remember now why I didn't, but a lot of LGBTQI people did present themselves to want to talk about Hull. Um, and it's quite complicated, actually. Um, and again, the the so, so we did get some people uh, I can't really talk for a whole community, um, can I? So I'm trying to think of specific examples. And some of them go back to the Sea of Hull project where people were naked and painted blue. So there was this sense of, um, again, being very visible within the city, but also being celebrated by the city itself in a way uh, that maybe uh, the LGBTQ community haven't. Um, there are uh, one participant, actually, his name's anonymized, so I, I'm okay to say this. Rob, the taxi driver that I was talking about, he uh, is actually a transvestite. And so uh, our conversations were also about the history of the polar bear um, venue in Hull, which was this uh, uh, LGBT venue. Um, and so he wanted to, he wanted to talk about that aspect of, of pride as well. So there's this, he actually liked, he preferred, he preferred it when it wasn't so visible in the city and that he found more freedom as a transvestite in the city within a more clandestine, um, uh, space, I think, um, Interestingly, he was from the west of the city and um, from that fishing community. So it's really, really complicated. Um, so what does foregrounding LGBTQ in Hull do? I think it's quite complicated in some ways. Um, in one way, and again, I need to do more thinking about this and, and probably more research. I think that the foregrounding of LGBT pride in Hull is doing something to work against the new Muslim communities in the city. And you do see within Hull um, uh, the, the two communities being pitted against each other uh, in a way that's really uncomfortable. I, I, I need to do more work on this before I can speak more fully, but um, we do see that happening. And I did think that through Hull 2017, there were, there were a lot of LGBT narratives, which I thought was great, but again, perhaps not as critically reflective as they might be, particularly with how LGBT pride has been commercialized um, and that it's lost perhaps the core of what um, LGBT pride was set up to do. So again, I suppose, what is that more of a top-down understanding of pride? rather than a bottom up. And this is Charlie's phrase. Charlie talks about pride from within. Um, so thank you, Charlie, for that one. Um, and I think that might be happening within LGBT presence in the city. I'd love to know what you think though, Catherine. 
Well, I mean, the first the first thing I'm thinking listening to this is there's so many resonances here with, you know, the kinds of politics of pride, visibility, urban space, you know, even relationships between LGBTQ communities and Muslim communities and other communities of colour, you know, but we see in cities all over Europe. What you were just saying about, you know, the way that Rob saw, you know, visibility versus clandestineness, for instance, reminds me so much of actually what someone like Francesca Stella, you know, has found in, you know, her, her research in Russia, for instance. But, you know, actually visibility for a number of her participants ended up bringing people into the spotlight in a way in which they hadn't been before. And, you know, for them, it had been easier to have the lives that they were used to without that extra magnifying glass on them. Similarly, you know, in terms of, you know, I think that's an important point you've just made there about, you know, all of us who are, you know, who are involved in anything to do with celebrating LGBTQ heritage need to make sure that can't be mobilized against Muslim communities, etc. Um, and, you know, again, that's a dynamic, you know, one sees in so many cities. Um, Fatima El Taib's work, for those who don't already know it, is really, really good on this. Um, and, you know, has shaped, I would say, a, a, lot, a lot of my thinking about it. Um, I think there is definitely a lot more, you know, a lot more that you can do here, you know, with the ways in which, you know, pride and aspects of LGBTQ presence and visibility and so on have related to each other in all this. And certainly, let's talk more. Thanks, Catherine. That's great. It's great to see such a, a rich um, discussion and conversation playing out um, here on screen and also in, in the chat as well. And Michael, I'm going to um, bring some other questions to you as well, because lots of people are asking really good questions. Um, I've noticed in the chat, Helen Nicholson. Helen, you've asked a question in the chat. Do you want to ask that on camera as well? Great. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, you probably know that Jenny Hughes is also here uh, and I kind of grappling with the idea of civic um, in all kinds of uh, different ways, but particularly in relationship to towns rather than cities. And the debate that we kind of keep circulating around is what is what what does the word civic bring to the party, as it were? What's distinctive or separate? And it 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 it, it one and I've been really interested in your thinking about that. Is it around something radical and place-based, or is it around something conservative and um, you know associated with governmentality, or is it a bit of any of those, or have I missed the point completely? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's complicated, isn't it? I, I would I would prefer the former, and I would like to try and reclaim. A, f a more progressive radical pride. I, I, I mean, I, I use that language, and then I think actually, well, Brexit was a kind of radical politics. So there's something about. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm drifting off civic. But like, what does radical now mean in this in this context? But back to the civic. Uh, first of all, I think yourself and Jenny are doing really important work to unpick those uh, uncomfortable. Uh, narratives of civic and who it includes and who it excludes. Um, in terms of the way that I approached it with my research, um, I, I didn't really impose an understanding of it because I wanted my participants to reveal their own understandings. Um, that said, uh, I did use the a framework, I don't know if you know the civic imaginary, I think I talked about it a little bit, but it's slightly too, well, I just felt it was a bit too theoretical to get into here, but it's um, uh, Bioki, I'm trying to find it on my shelf, Bioki and colleagues, I can't remember the, uh, the, the, the other names of the colleagues, have you got it? And I think, I think within that, and also within the Young Foundation's Civic Strength uh, report, there is a way of recovering pride, uh, civic pride, I think, and the notion of the civic that's in working towards something. So collectively working towards something. Of course, whenever you talk about a collective, you've then you've got boundaries and you've got borders and people might be included and people might, might not be included. That goes right back to the histories of 
well, you know, we're going back to the Romans, aren't we? Um, so I think you have to handle it, you have to try and handle it carefully and also understand where the frame is. And I don't know, perhaps there's a civic frame we need to think about, but you know, who is allowed in and who isn't? Um, I, I suppose within my research, I was limited by the people that presented themselves to me. So um, Hull has a very strong uh, labour vote traditionally. So most of my participants were um, either current or former. I did have a lot of former labour voters um, that felt dislocated by what was happening. Um, yeah, I, 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 need, I need to think about this more, but I was at your, um, your event on the, the Civic recently, and I was struck by it's how quickly the civic can be, well, can be claimed by so many other issues. And it's it sort of, it's so slippery, isn't it? It disappears very quickly and can be taken over by lots of other people's concerns, which are absolutely valid. Um, perhaps in a way that we did at the beginning of the questioning, we were talking about LG, an LGBT community. How do we, perhaps it's, well, it's utopian, isn't it? I guess we're in that territory. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's in, that actually that's incredibly helpful. That you're finding it as challenging as as certainly I am. I won't speak for Jenny here. It it, it it's it's an incredibly slip, slippery concept, and I think because it's being reclaimed in all kinds of interesting ways, then there, there's also a risk that it. Um, it becomes something that is kind of a softening of some fairly appalling agendas. Um, so, you know, the, there's a kind of vigilance, I think, to be marked around the idea of the civic, which will be really interesting to discuss more. So I'll shut up here and say thank you very much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Helen. Thank you, Michael. Now, there's, there's quite a lot of questions in the chat. I might draw a few together that are, are on sort of around similar topics and we might see if if we can how many we can kind of dash through by about seven o'clock, Michael. So this is this is the quick fire round. Think, think of it like that. Uh, so first of all, um, I noticed there's quite a lot of conversation in the chat around the university. And, and maybe that doesn't take us that far from thinking about the civic as well. What the role of the university in, in Hull might be, the, whether there's pride in the university, what the role is of the university in pride in the city or civic pride. And we there's lots of conversation about the civic university at the moment, isn't, isn't there? And I wondered whether actually that kind of also connects with that really interesting question you asked about the role of universities potentially in critique as well as celebration and resourcing pride. And so could you just reflect for us briefly on the role of the university in this, in Hull and maybe more broadly? Yeah, I've got a lot to say about this. Um, and it's quite difficult. I, I think that the University of Hull have absented themselves from many of the conversa critical conversations that needed to happen about Hull and Hull 2017. I, I'm learning about university funding systems. <laughs> But what I'm learning is that they're going the same way if they're not there already. Well, it's the neoliberalization of the university in the same way that we've seen the neoliberalization of culture and perhaps neoliberalization through leveling up of the community in which municipalism and perhaps this is where civic becomes slippery as well because it's become so much about uh, the individual. Um, is 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 removed. Hull, the University of Hull found itself in a very difficult situation when it came to the evaluation of 2017 because they were a partner. They were, a I think the term was strategic partner. Other people here might know better, which meant that it was very difficult for individuals to speak publicly, critically about some elements of Hull 2017. I want to be absolutely clear that I'm not being critical of the whole Hull 2017 initiative to put on that kind of event in one year is a massive achievement. And you know, it's an extraordinary kind of thing to do that requires an awful lot of, um, I use the word chutzpah in my PhD, but that 
particular top-down approach brings with it certain problems. A number of my participants describe full 2017 management at times as bullying. Um, and, and, you know, so if you're a university in that situation, how do you engage with some of those issues when we clearly do need to look at, I think, the management of some of these um, cultural mega events? How do you do that from a university when your funding is also under threat? How do you do that for the unboxed festival when essentially you're criticizing the paymaster? Um, perhaps the solution might not come from within academia. I don't know, perhaps the criticism, perhaps our bigger cultural institutions need to step up. Um, unfortunately, many of them are involved with the Unbox Festival. And I know, Helen, that you're involved with it as well. So I, I really do um, hope that there's a way of resisting from within. Um, uh, um, I, yeah, I think there are other questions, I'll leave it there. I think it's it's like you're not getting the easy questions this evening, are you? But I think that's the nature of the very, very complex, as you, you keep saying, very, very complicated issues that you've been teasing out this evening in your in your presentation. <clears throat> There's some really interesting discussion going on in the chat um, around different ways that um, different kind of personal stories or folk memory or traditions can, can be mobilised um, in pride in place. But you, you were just talking, you just touched um, Michael on um, the dangers of top-down approaches. And there's a very specific question in the chat from um, Gillian Osgaby, apologies if I've not pronounced your surname right, Gillian, um, on about a particular project. Gillian, do you want to ask that? And maybe this is one that we could open out more broadly too. Yeah, I'm the product director of the Holy Auction Maritime City project. So it's, um, it's relevant for me in terms of the project's got two halves. It's about capital works to restore five of Hull's maritime assets, but also an activity program that's very much meant to be community based and community led, um, and also a cultural program that supports the project in raising its profile, but also engaging in different communities with different people around the city. However, in, in whatever makes what maritime means to them, and I suppose it really struck home in terms of 2017, being felt being very top down and that's the last thing that I think that we want to be in terms of our project but I think it's very difficult in terms of obviously we're delivering it and we have to deliver it specifically to get the outcomes for the, the funding significant amount of funding that we've got from the lottery so a lot of it is expectations things we have to deliver and I suppose it sort of struck a chord of thinking well how do we avoid doing that is it possible to avoid doing that or I suppose sometimes there is going to be an element of top down that's just unavoidable but are there elements or think different things we can do to make sure that it's not all top down and that it's more inclusive? Yeah, um, I, I, I appreciate the difficult situa situation that you're in. And I'm sure that um, whole 2017 leaders would say that that's the sort of situation that they were in as well, when you, you know, you're having to speak to, to funders. Um, I, I suppose there's literatures there about participation and like the ladder of participation and ensuring that you are um, genuinely doing uh, community work with the community and not on or just as aestheticizing a community. Um, I, I think that the fact that you're here and the fact that you've asked the question is a really good thing um, and that it opens up the conversation and that there's a sensitivity to it. That's not always the case. And also, um, I, uh, from the work that we've done in Southampton on the Towns and Cultural Economies of Recovery Project, I think there are a lot of cultural leaders at the moment feeling the same thing. Um, and particularly when you're working in contested, the space of contested heritage. Um, so I, I don't know how, how do we get together to perhaps it's through things like this, or perhaps we need more networks where we can talk about things like this and work collectively to influence funders. Um, uh, there's, I, I have to be honest, I don't know enough about the heritage, particular heritage um, imperatives from funders, but you can look at the UK City of Culture documentation actually, which is all about celebrating places. Uh, and I wonder if 
we need to just moderate, not moderate, but nuance and find other words uh, for that language. So it's not just about celebrating, it's about asking not just critical questions, but other, it shouldn't be so binary, other questions about places. Um, I don't know, if, I don't know if that helps, Gillian. No, it does, definitely. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's um, uh, it's not just about funders. I suppose it's the way that we establish projects. And I think um, it is good that we're really well-resourced projects and that we've got engagement officers in specialists who are engagement officers. You know, we have a professional, professional comms lead. It's a really well-resourced project and it's about using that resource in, in the right way to make sure that we're not um, missing opportunities and that it, yeah, I suppose it doesn't, start to become something that we're imposing. It's about bringing people with us rather than imposing it on people. I have thought about something else actually, was that I did approach the whole 2017 monitoring and evaluation team to ask them about shame and negative emotions. And they said, I'm paraphrasing, uh, we think that you should be careful about how you use that word. Those emotions didn't come up in our research at all. And I didn't reply, but obviously it didn't come up in their research because they were only asking questions about pride. Their frame mm -hmm. was so narrow. So I think it's about when you approach and when you work within a community is to perhaps it's not, it's, it's asking open questions. And it's about yeah. really looking at, at what that data is saying rather than uh, looking for a specific narrative from the beginning. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Michael. I mean, obviously, something that many of us listening to this conversation, it's useful for so many of us working in so many different settings, thinking about these questions of how we can avoid being being top down and work in these genuinely participatory ways, the, the work with sort of genuine co-production, um, which is, is always really, it's actually much more of a challenge, isn't it, than it, than it, than it might appear. Um, it's hard. It's hard. We've got a couple of uh, other questions I want to come to in, in the chat. I noticed um, Christopher Curry. Chris, you, you asked a question about international comparisons. Uh, I, I know that Catherine and Michael touched on that in one particular context um, in, in their discussion a moment ago. So we, I, I don't know whether we'll be able to kind of come to that again. We, we'll, we'll see, but um, we might be able to kind of follow this up um, after, after this evening. But I definitely wanted to come to Emily. Emily, you've asked your question in the chat, but I see you're on camera. So do you want to to ask the question now, that'd be great, thanks. Sure, so you can see it in the chat already, but um, I was really interested in your findings about the language of corporate boosterism that people are using and how that was really widespread, not just in your research for this project, but also for your other projects. And I haven't really got a, a clear question to ask because what I really want to ask is what's going on there? Like, why is that happening? Is it that people are um, using, trying to use the right language to talk to academics? or, um, and they don't use it outside of that? Is it that there isn't a language that actually describes what it feels like to be in a place and that this kind of embodied affective experience needs a different type of terminology that isn't as widespread, so they're latching on something else. But just what do you think is going on, um, even at a guess? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, we know from the affect, affect literature that it's trying to put into words something that is almost uh, unpronounceable. <laughs> um, so that's the, the first thing. Um, so it's difficult, you know. Um, I, I'm sure that Stuart Hall would have had something to say about this. And I think he might have done about the way that language trickles down and becomes normalized. I think it might have been Stuart Hall. Um, if anybody could correct me, please do. Um, but I, I, I do think that's part of the picture here is that we've got, we've got, I was, sorry, I've just, my brain's just gone to somebody that said something at, at an early conference I attended about Liverpool City of Culture. And they said that, and I know, and I know Nayan's in the room, so I don't know if Nayan might want to come into this, that somebody said, um, it was a, a, a conference, I was in the first year at Hull, and somebody said they knew that Hull was a UK city of culture when the blade arrived in the city centre. Until then, they hadn't been convinced, and it need, they needed something, and it was, it was because Hull had something like Liverpool 
that made Hull, it gave it the genuine city of culture experience for them. Um, That's fascinating. Michael, can, can we, if, if, Nayan, if you want to come in on that, I wondered if we could, do, do you want to share any kind of response or reaction to that? That might be a little unfair, but um, Nayan Kulkarni, who's in the room, uh, as Michael said, um, he was he's a site specific artist and he created that blade installation, the huge wind turn, turbine blade in, in, in the centre of Hull. Um, we've kind of ambushed you a bit there, Nayan, but is there anything mm, you yeah. want to say in Sorry. response to that? I'm sure <laughs> Sorry, you don't mind. So, so could, you, could you read, could you just, um, was it a question or an observation, I guess, you were asking for? Um, yeah, well, it's the problem, the problem with um, critical spectacle, um, which is something that sculptors um, uh, think about a lot. But I, I, th I think you're right. The, the, when there's, you, you go to an event like We Are Whole, which was terrific, and in some time, and, and, and I could see on the opening night how moved people were. But of course, the story being told was either a kind of generically historical story, which is fine. And then, and then when I observed the audience, I realized it was a lot more than that. So it wasn't actually the artwork or the projections that gave me the sense that it was specific. It was the way the audience responding to it. So of course I had no access to the internal space of the people I saw um, clearly moved and also you know, amazed by the size of the projections. But I, I guess Blade um, was just emphatic and uh, in, and un unapologetic, and I think, um, in a sense, that that's why that started to function the way it might have done. Uh, and it also looked like uh, a big international art installation, um, I guess. I love that idea of the, the dangers of the critical spectacle, though. Yes, and, and how um, how the meaning of that, the slippage. Um, in kind of the way that that is appropriated and, and invested with meaning uh, once, that's, once that's there and in the public space. Um, is there anything you want to, to add, uh, Michael, in response to Nayan or, or to Emily's question? We've drifted away from thriving, Emily, I'm a, sorry, but I, there's something there about how it also turns the audience into the spectacle, doesn't it? So we are whole and both, you know, as, as massive as the blade was, it was also we we uh, the experience of well, it's a relational uh, experience, isn't it? You're also watching other people touching it or gazing at it, feeling it, and talking about it. So, um, you know, there's, there's just there's, there is there's something there about the the audience becoming the spectacle. Um, the, the, in terms of the, the kind of pride of place, I mean, Siemens um, deployed all sorts of. Um, very particular kinds of documentary narratives when they were selling their new plant. And a lot of that was to do with pride, pride in labour. So um, uh, it, it certainly wasn't cynical, but it was very knowingly um, manipulating particular kind of narratives. I, I, I wouldn't call them working class narratives, but the narratives that are, are uh, very much part of the they're not un, they're not the unconscious of all they're very conscious and they're very talked about and they were mobilized by um in, in order to sell a kind of um multinational vision of a kind of utopian future of production in the city and i think i think that's also why it chimed because it 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 was made by people in hull and that was understood by the audience to be complicated I think. and there's some really really um really interesting observations there as well um about you know michael from, from from you two on on um how how blade kind of created a space for a very performative expression of pride um in in, in the city and and make, made available made that made that available and also maybe are you, are you talking about a kind of a performative expression of the corporate in some way you talked about you know people doing things together and watching each other and that kind of moment of embodiment as a as a corporate body I mean it's very interesting as, as a historian obviously I'm thinking of of rituals and moments in, in you know the long view that have created space for that but it I'm struck by what you're what you might be suggesting there it's very interesting yeah I need to go back to the books but Judith Butler has something to say about the formative assembly 
Um, I'm looking to the academics in the room if they can help me. But um, how people, I think it's that how in a time of crisis, uh, her definition of the performative assembly is that in a time of crisis, people come together to, um, uh, I'm really re reducing it, it uh, to protest essentially. There's a lot more to it than that, but the performative assembly might help. Um, That's really interesting, Michael. Thank you. It sounds like a go go back to Butler moment. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. I will. But, but there, there are a lot of those. Um, that's that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, look, I think we are going to have to to wrap up the seminar. I'm I'm so conscious of how Michael's presence and his presentation this evening has brought together so many wonderful people in this room. So many amazing projects. So many um, rich experience um, from you know, really different um, perspectives and sectors from within um, academia, from projects within Hull, local, um, you know, understanding and knowledge of Hull. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant, Michael, and a really rich discussion that it's a shame to kind of curtail, but I'm sure there are dinners to be eaten and children to be tucked in and all sorts. Um, so thank you so much. Can we all join in thanking Michael again for a wonderful presentation?